All right. All right, thanks everyone for tuning in. Um, so yeah, I've, I've been tasked with the, the task of discussing how you might go about getting a job, um, job seeker skills. How do you prepare for that next position? And as uh, Lauren said, I've had some firsthand experience uh, with this in the last uh, few weeks. I've got to figure out how to use this screen. Right. Um, with my son who just finished his uh, degree at Monash in honours, uh, honours degree last year, and uh, was about to take a year off to go overseas and have that big year off, you know, travel around the world and COVID happened. So he's stuck in Australia and then it's, well, what do I do now? I need to look for a job. Um, a job which is not just doing labouring work, which is what he's currently doing. And of course you think being a, you know, with a biological background and with, um, you know, having had experience with viruses and bacteria during his honours year, he should be you know, in with a chance, lots of jobs out there in that area. So goes online, looks um, for all positions, which there are plenty of at all the hospitals and CSL and whatnot, prepares his CV, prepares his letter off. Oh, yeah, it looks pretty good, you know, um, but, it, but so he sends a letter off and then he gets promptly three, three um, rejections, which of course uh, sent him spiraling down. I mean, what's wrong with me? He had a really good marks, really good background. What's wrong? Um, and then he actually rang one of the hospitals and said, look, I don't understand why I wasn't shortlisted for this microbiology job. Uh, I've got the skills. And the response was, yeah, you might have the skills, but you're very research oriented and we're looking for someone with more practical skills. So the mistake he had made is that he wrote a generic, relatively generic letter to these three different hospitals, um, emphasizing how great he'd done in his, uh, in his honors and his undergraduate and all of his experience, but very much based around his research experience, not the sort of thing that they were looking, looking for. So that was a mistake. And I, even with my experience, when I read his letter and his CV, didn't pick up on that. And that was uh, my bad. And so when I agreed to give the seminar, I thought, well, okay, what do you do when you are looking for a job in a specific area? You must do your homework, obviously. And, and also don't get despondent if you do get the rejection letters. Um, you, you know, you're not rubbish. You're not, you know, not, you're not terrible. It's just you haven't maybe portrayed yourself in the, in the right way for the job that you are going for. And I'll come back later on to some other examples in, even from our own team where that happened last year. I won't name names, but uh, the people if they're on will know. And um, similarly, in that case, the person who had applied for a particular job hadn't realised what the skill sets were that were required for that job. And so when they interviewed and presented their, uh, their CV and their letter, they hadn't actually addressed the criterion properly that were, was required for that particular job. So, so that's the first sort of thing to think about now. So before you even start to look for jobs, you have to start thinking about what is it that I want to do? I mean, I've just finished my master's or my honours or my PhD, or I finished my postdoc. I want to look for my next job. What is the sort of job I'm looking for? Is it a job in research? Is it a job that's more applied? Is it a job that might be communications, marketing? There's all these different possibilities out there for, for you, all of you, for all of us, uh, even though we might have been studying uh, as researchers and doing a very specific project that very specific project is probably not where you're going to get your, your next job. So the first thing you have to do is decide, well, what is the sort of job I'm looking for? And also what are the skills that I have? Not the precise skills that you've learned during your PhD or your master's or your undergrad, um, if you're doing a research project, but what skills have I learned during my time in the job I've been doing or the study I've been doing? And how do I sell those skills? How do I use those skills? So using my son as an example again, you know, he had been working with viruses and doing all sorts of different assays. And yes, it was a very research oriented project as honours is, but he, he had learned a lot of um, instrumental skill sets. He learned a lot of data analysis. He'd learned a lot of statistical analysis. So those are the skills he should have sold, if you like, when he went for a job that was in a lab, pathology lab, where they wanted precision. They wanted care with instrumentation. So think about what are my skills? And what are the job, what sort of job am I looking for? And how do those skills fit in to that job? So if you've done, um, say, a, a PhD in, in battery, lithium batteries, for example, okay, many of us in the centre have working on different battery uh, materials and different bat devices. And your PhD has been very specific around a particular type of battery, say lithium batteries. You need to not necessarily think that's going to be where your next job is going to be, whether it be in a research lab or whether it be in a, in a startup or CSIRO or Defence or any of those organisations, you, you want to look and say, well, what have I learned during that, that PhD? What skills do I have? I have skills in project planning and management. I have skills in, in presumably using 
different types of instrumentation, different types of equipment. Um, I, I, I have skills um, in, in, um, in writing, I have skills in presenting. So you have to really think about those skills and where you might be able to use those skills in the next job that you're looking for. And how do you, how do you sell those particular skills? Okay. Having decided, for example, that you've gone from being um, someone who's been making materials for energy, energy applications, say, or chemists, say, but you now think, well, maybe you want to actually move into an area where you might use those in a real, more applied area, a real device. Now, how do you sell to the company who wants someone who's going to make batteries? How do you sell to them that actually I'm the right person for you because I've worked, you know, with, say, electrolyte or electrode materials? How do you sell that? You probably haven't made, maybe you haven't made a battery in your life, but you can still sell yourself even if you haven't made a battery in your life. And I'll give you a ex personal example again. You know, every job that I've had has never been the same. It's always building on the skills that I learned in my last job. You know, I left my PhD not having done molecular dynamic simulations. I sold myself to do MD simulations because I happened to be in the group where someone was doing it and I knew the language. So I was able to. Um, I won't say, um, it, it, was, it was a real, I, I knew enough about the language to be able to sell myself in that area. Um, you know, when I got the job at Monash, you know, I didn't know anything about corrosion. I sold myself by using my, my previous skills to learn something new. So you've got to sell those skills. Know your skills and sell them. So if you've gone from being an electrolytes person, electrode person, to being an applied battery person, you have to be able to say, you know what, even though I haven't done that particular task, I am aware of how it is done. I have, I'm a quick learner. I've done these things before. So you have to be able to sell that in your CV and in your letter. I'll come to those in a moment. Okay, so before we get to that CV and the letter, how do you even find a job? Okay, there's lots of different things you can do, obviously, when you're looking for a job. One of the obvious things is, is online, online job searches. The various platforms um, on the web um, that you can search um, uh, for, for jobs that are being advertised. There's also a lot of industry and science magazines. Um, so a lot of the, for example, in the corrosion area, the Australian Corrosion Association has a, a magazine that will also um, uh, display jobs. Uh, so you can look at the industry magazines um, for the job adverts online and hard copies. It's probably also important to create a LinkedIn professional profile if you haven't already got one. So first thing my son did after he got the rejections was make a LinkedIn profile and try, to try and connect with some people. Um, and that, is a very uh, important um, tool. And just before this particular webinar, we had another workshop with um, a colleague at, uh, at Deakin about how you might, what you can tell from people's personality and people's, uh, um, what people look for from their LinkedIn profile. So put some care and thought into your LinkedIn profile and how you, how you create and how you present that. Um, you can use your resources. So if you finish doing your honours or your PhD or your postdoc, your supervisors or, or people in the team may have connections either within other universities, within Australia, external to Australia, within the industry community, within the, the consultancy community, um, within communications uh, industry. So we should, don't be afraid to ask um, people, senior people in your team about opportunities, can they connect you with someone that they know? Um, oftentimes the job that you get is through connections with other people. Again, even within my, my, my own son, I reached out to people that I knew that worked in hospitals. I said, if you happen to have something, you know, um, my son's looking for a job now, nothing's happened yet, but that's just a way of trying to connect with people that you might, um, that might have an opportunity uh, for you. You could also cold call, cold calling. I don't mean picking up the phone necessarily. Usually that would be um, writing an email, often through a LinkedIn um, message. You can, when you're looking through LinkedIn, you might find, um, uh, find opportunities there and you can message someone through that. Um, and again, carefully wording uh, your, your, your message um, and, and see if there's any opportunities available in that particular business or, or research organization. If you're looking for a postdoc position, you might want to look to see if there isn't already one that's advertised out there um, in the normal channels. You might be able to think, well, how can I fund my own position? So you should be aware of the fellowships that are around both within your own university, within CSIRO, within um, other, other organisations um, in, in terms of internationally, especially there are uh, international fellowships that you guys might be um, eligible for. 
um, in America with the Fulbrights, in Europe they're the Marie Curies. Um, and probably in that circumstance, I recommend that you identify who it is that you want to work with um, and, and find out what they're doing. It might not be directly in your field. Again, in my own personal circumstances, my, my first postdoc in the States, you know, I did a PhD in aqueous solution glasses for IVF, but I ended up working on polymer electrolytes. Um, and I did that because I had done some reading. I had identified some people I wanted to work with. I wrote to them. Um, I sold myself with the skills that I had. Um, and, and, and that's, you know, how I got my first postdoc. So identify the people who you think you want to work with. Best if actually your supervisor or someone that you know also is aware of that person, because then you might be able to get a, uh, uh, them to also write an email and say, you know, I, I, this person has worked with me, um, here's a skill set. If you have a position available, please consider them. Uh, and I've done that for some of my people in my own group um, in the last sort of few months as well. And if you can, arrange to, arrange to meet them if possible, just to, even if it's just for a for conversation, doesn't have to be about asking for a job, just I'm interested in your work, can I come and have a conversation with you? Um, in today's uh, social distancing age, you might be over Zoom as opposed to um, in person, but still try and make connections like that. If it's a job in industry, one of the ways that you can find, um, find uh, openings uh, or potential openings is through joining associations and going to networking events. Um, that means, for example, the RACI, if you're in chemistry, um, the Royal Australian Chemical Institute, it means, the, again, the ACA for, for people doing the corrosion related, electrochemically related activities. Um, there are other institutions that institutes uh, associations that you can join and they, um, they have networking events that you're uh, able to participate in. Um, and if you do join those associations, think about volunteering to be on some of the committees. I know within our, our own team, uh, again, I talk about the ACA because Corrosion Association, because that's something we're, we're quite involved in, but um, both students and postdocs have joined the, the young uh, corrosionists or, or, um, or the various associations where they can, uh, various groupings where they can network, um, they meet industry, they can sort of sell themselves, if you like, um, by, meet, by meeting different people. Um, so I do highly recommend if you're early on, you haven't finished your PhD yet or your postdoc position yet, and you're looking at for what that next job might be, and it might be industry, look and see what are the appropriate associations that you could join, and can you volunteer your time to be able to network with some of the key people in those, in those associations. Okay. So you know what job you want, you sort of made some connections and now you, you think, well, how do I get that job? You know, hire me. How do I get that job? How do you apply for the job? What, what, are, the, what are the things you need to do um, apart from just hopefully, I mean, one option is you meet someone at one of these uh, events and you are offered a job. Unlikely, but that's one opportunity. But if you're applying for a job in a normal way, you're writing a cover letter and you're writing your CV, what do you need to do? Okay. So the cover letter, this is something which is really, really important. I know myself and probably most of the, of the academics um, in ACES and in our universities would get half a dozen at least uh, emails um, a week saying, um, I, I'd love to come and work with you. Do you have a position? Um, and you can kind of tell when those emails are just uh, generic. Sometimes they don't even write the right name. Um, even as dear sir, madam, or dear professor, or dear whatever. Uh, and then there are others who write much more personalised um, emails. And, and then I might stop and read that email, and I might look at the CV, and I might say, hmm, maybe I don't have a position, but someone else I know might, I might forward that email on. So that cover letter, whether it's an email or a, or a handwritten or, or a type sent mail letter, um, more email these days, of course, that's really, really important. It's super important and shouldn't be generic, okay? So again, knowing your audience. So if you're going to be applying for a job in a research lab, like at a university or a CSRO or DSTG or one of the hospitals or the, um, the other um, health research labs, then you would, you would be writing to someone um, about your research skills and you would be trying to address the right person. You wouldn't say, dear sir, madam, you'd find the right person who you really want to work with and you address that particular person and you talk about your research skills in that, in that letter. If it's industry, they don't really want to know necessarily about your research skills. So what you want to do then is, is 
think about, well, is industry a startup industry? Is it a small company? Is it a large company? Um, what are they looking for? What can, what can I look at? What do I have to offer that particular um, uh, group of people, startup, the SME, the big company? What, what, what do I have to offer? And write your letter according to, to that audience. Then you have to also understand the role you're applying for. There's not much point saying, I'm going to apply for a role to, um, to research, I mean, I'll take a battery example, to, to make new materials, um, advanced materials, say, for batteries, when the company is looking at actually just um, measure, making a standard batteries and measuring lithium ions, say, and measuring their, their, their performance, and, and I don't really care about new materials. They don't want to know about your research strengths. They want to know about what you have learned that helps you uh, do the job that they're, that they're wanting you to do. So understand the role you're applying for, really important. Uh, like my son applying for, for a job in a pathology lab and talking about his research skills, that wasn't very helpful. Then in your letter, you have to show that you're confident and you're enthusiastic about the particular role and a particular company you're applying for. Um, but, be, but don't write two pages, like be concise, write short, sharp, Letters are much better than very, very long, waffly letters. And, and you have to say, why should I even look at my, go to the next page, look at my CV or my resume? Why would they even look at, at my resume? Okay, so that's really important in the cover letter to cover, to cover those things. Know your audience, know what sort of job you, is you're going for, um, try and personalise it, understand the role you're actually applying for, and be confident, without being cocky, be confident in your, in your, in your letter. So let's look at more detail. And now I want some input from the audience, some more detail. Um, I purchased this off, off a, a web page, which actually was quite a good website, glassdoor.com. How to write a cover letter. Okay, so here, is the, here are what they consider to be the, the four key areas for you to think about. Okay, first of all, pretty five. First of all, the, the salutation. Dear, dear, not dear sir, madam. Um, really, if you've done your homework, you may have already rung the company or you may have already emailed someone. If you have a name, you put the name in here, dear Heather or dear Maria, dear professor, so-and-so. Um, Personalise it. Really, really make them want to read it because it's to them, not to some, somebody else, some, someone out there in the ether. And then your intro paragraph. So I guess I'd like some think thoughts from, the, from, from you guys. You know, what would you put into the intro paragraph? How would you make it unique? Um, how do you grab the reader's attention? How do you make them want to keep reading? Any any thoughts from anyone? Any hands up? I'm going to have any hands up. No hands? No one knows? No, no one knows. has her hand up, but she had her hand up from early on, so I'm thinking it wasn't in relation to this. Is that right, Vadika? Okay. All right, well, we'll keep... All right, let me see if I can, uh, oops, what have I done here? Now I've got to find, I've lost myself now. Uh, oops. Okay, here I am, back again. Oops, no. Uh, sorry, I seem to have gone too far. All right. Right. Okay. You've got to be a bit, you, your unique opening line, your first few sentences are really, really important. So I guess the, and I don't know, I, I don't have any answers necessarily for this particular unique opening line, but what I do think you need to do is be, be straightforward about, um, the role you're applying for. So, you know, dear Professor so-and-so, um, I read with great interest your uh, advertisement regarding the position in your centre of excellence or in your training centre or in, in your university or if it's a research position. Um, and I'm interested in applying for the role because, okay, because, not just I'm interested in applying for the role, because why, why are you even writing this letter? You know, what is it that really is interesting about the role, the university, if it's an industry job or, or a job in a hospital, that, that particular group of people, that company, why are you interested in that role? So I'll give you an example, I guess, from the point of view of, uh, let's just take one of our industry partners in the training centre, Calix, a company who are making um, high surface area materials for a number of different, uh, different applications. Um, they've advertised for someone, they've got, a, they've got a space for someone, say, in the area of making, um, or they're expanding into making, say, new, new battery, battery um, materials. And they advertise, you know, a position that says, um, great opportunity for, a, 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 say, an inorganic or a chemist or material scientist uh, with, with skills in 
I don't know, synthesis and characterization of blah, blah, blah. They, they describe the, the position, um, must, must have a particular set of skills. Um, you need to then address that in your, in your letter. You need to say, you know, dear whoever um, at, at Calix, um, I read with interest your, your advertisement uh, for the new position that you're offering. Um, I, I have, um, I'm excited about the opportunity for working for your, your company in this new air endeavor because you know, you've got to be enthusiastic, you've got to use the right language, you've got to, um, but you've got to also be truthful to what you know, right? Um, so you need to um, understand the job and, and write to that job and with enthusiasm and confidence. Once you've done that first paragraph, which says why you're interested in that job and why you should be considered further, then the next paragraph is talking about what you've already done, your skill set. Now, here is also very important. If the job is a research job, you can talk about your research project and, and what, your, what skills you acquire, how many papers you might have published, you know, high quality papers, blah, 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 citations, etc. cetera, maybe. Um, if it's a job that's in industry, again, if it's a job in a big company, think about what that role is. If that role is to work within a, a team to characterise, to run a particular instrument to characterise materials, or if that role is in a smaller company where you will, you will be the only person actually developing a new area. What is it that you've done in your previous life, your previous work, that will allow you to jump into that new role and have impact, okay? Um, so I think this is a, the, the part where you really, you sell yourself, your skill set. Um, whether you're, you know, if it's, a, again, that has to be related to the actual job that you are, um, you're applying for. Um, if you're going to be you know, working in a pathology lab just doing, doing routine testing, then you want to say how you're not going to be bored doing that testing, right? Because you're much more in saying you've done these always great things, but the job you're applying for is going to be pretty routine. If you're comfortable with the routine job, then say why you would be the right person for that job, all right? Your, 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 whatever skills you have that make you right for that particular job. Um, your, your, your perseverance, your, your detail to accuracy, your whatever it is, and, and with some evidence backing, backing that. And then in the, in, in the end, the closing paragraph, again, re, restate why it is that, that you are interested in this position. Um, so, Tony, you got your hand up. Yeah, Maria, I was just going to say, a lot of the applications that I read that I tend to take note of, they start with my professional, academic and personal experiences have prepared me for this job. And then they just do a few dot point summaries of Fantastic. what they put down and then you sort of think, oh, okay, you've got a little bit of where they're coming from and know what they've thought about. So that's just something like in the yep. applications I've read. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think I, I agree with you, Attorney, that that's really pointing out why it is that you're, what's prepared you for the job you're applying for. That's really what you're, what, what that's about. And I think maybe even after this, we can, we can think about putting together some, some typical, um, uh, best uh, best uh, practice cover letters just for people to have a look at maybe or some, some opening statements. I'd like to know what other people think would be a good opening statement. If, if you were the one who was uh, receiving the letter, what would you want to see uh, as that opening statement? Right? So I guess there's no more hands up. So there's no... Okay. At the end of your letter, you have to finish with, um, with uh, inviting the person to sort of write back to you. So looking forward very much with enthusiasm to your response. Please if, if don't hesitate to contact me on blah, blah, blah. If you need any more information, blah, blah, blah. You really need to, um, to call to action at the end of your letter. Um, so not too long. Specify why, um, why you're interested in this job. Why you're the right person for this job. What are your skill sets, your soft skills and your, and your hard skills. And then how you'd like the, the, them to, to get back to you basically. Now, if you send that letter and you don't get any response, I think you should actually um, follow up. Because again, my, uh, with both my kids um, in their first jobs, people apply for lots, lots of jobs. You sometimes don't get called back. They, they lose your application. If you actually um, write to them and say in a week's time and say, or a few days time and say, look, did you get, I've got my application. I'm really excited by this job. Um, hopefully they will write back and say, no, sorry we filled it or yes, we're, we're, we're interested and, and we'll get back to you. So do follow up. Okay. 
So you've written your cover letter, super important because that will lead the person to read the rest of your CV or not, I think. So now the CV also can't be generic. Again, same mistake that um, I've seen many people make that I see as I read and also in this case my son recently, one CV does not fit all jobs you're applying for, tailor it. If your job you're applying for is a research job, stress your research experience, stress the things that you are good at about your research, in your research. If you've written grants, any grants, any awards that you might've gotten, your papers, your contribution to papers, um, like be very specific about what your skill set is in terms of the research, um, a research related job. And that means all things like, not just things being able to run, run experiments, but, but things about planning, things about presenting, um, and, and that always, always give the factual information, right? Like for example, you know, I, I have a, a excellent presentation skills as evidenced by, you know, hopefully you've got some, some, some experience in presenting. Um, you know, my writing skills are evidenced by whatever it is, like just like, first of all, series have to be fairly, um, um, what's the word, precise in terms of specifying what, you ha what your skills are. But also I think it's good to have a, a, a paragraph or two describing some of your skills or backing up some of the skills that you've, you've stated in your, in your CV. Again, if it's a marketing startup, lab tech, science presenter, writer, then stress the skills that you have that make you perfect for that job. So do not send a research oriented CV for a job that's about uh, being a lab technician or being in selling and marketing or being in a startup or, or whatever. You've got to tailor your CV to the job you are applying for. Okay. So as you can see in that little cartoon I've got there, you know, uh, so you've flown around the world in a plane, settled revolutions in Spain, around a golf course, you're under a par, Metro Goldwyn and Usher's star. Very impressive, I must admit. But we're looking for someone with marketing experience. So your CV has to present the information that the, the employer wants for the job that they are advertising. Okay. Super important. Any questions or comments on that from anyone? Nope. Okay. Happy for some more interaction, but never mind. Okay, so you've written your you've written your letter, you've written your CV, and now you're lucky enough to get to the interview. Okay. And as I said just before, if you don't if you don't hear back from from your application, follow up. You know, my son rang up the hospital and said, "Why didn't I get shortlisted?" Okay, and they were very honest. The HR department gave him the honest truth. You know, you didn't have, we don't look for a researcher, we're looking for someone who has skills in blah. So follow up, follow up if you don't get through and, and find out why you didn't, you know, what, what, was, what was missing in your, in your uh, application or in your skill set. Okay, so you get to the interview. Now, this is the point where you can make it or break it. You may have a fantastic CV, but it's when they see the whites of your eyes, they're talking to you and, and, and they see, whether you've got the enthusiasm, whether you really, um, what you wrote on paper is honest, um, which, so you've got to be careful what you wrote on paper, um, but, and also your ability to sell those skills that you have on paper, okay? And also your career objectives. So if the job you're going for is something which is a stepping stone to a future job, um, it's an opportunity to really let the employer know. Uh, if, you're, if you're an entrepreneurial and you are starting up with a, with a, with a, you know, with a startup, you know, let them know what your what, what your um what what it is that your aspirations are. So it's an opportunity to sell your abilities and career objectives. Dress professionally. Um, you know, even if it's even if it's a uh, <clears throat> video interview, you still want to dress professionally. Okay, you still want to make show be the part. Uh, you don't want to be a, a, a sort of a, a slob um, in the interview. You want to show that you're professional. Um, be on time. Again, uh, if it's a video interview, and I've had many of these where it's very frustrating, you've got to make sure your internet works. You've got to make sure if it's a video or you're, share, you know, you're, you're on the phone, whatever it is, that you have a good line, a good internet connection. If it means your home environment doesn't have it, find somewhere where, it, where, where you can get really good connection, connectivity. So whether it's a video or whether it's live, it's really, really important, I think, to prepare your one minute pitch. Um, now, when I've done video uh, uh, interviews with people overseas, whether it's for students or whether it's for postdocs um, and, and other positions like, like that, I've asked them to prepare me two or three slides ahead of time. And those two or three slides are there to help. The video is really important. It's really more difficult than it is face-to-face. -face. 
But if you've got two or three slides that describe who you are, what you've done, and, and um, what your aspirations might be with regard to the job you're applying for, that allows both you and the interview panel to have a, a point of reference as opposed to just trying to connect over, 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 over the screen. So I think it's really, really important to present, to prepare your one minute pitch. If it's face to face, be ready with, you know, tell us a bit about yourself. Now be ready for that question, but be concise. I've had interviewees to come in and talk and talk and talk and talk um, without, you know, and you can't get in to sort of ask the questions you want to ask. That's not good. I've had interviewees that come in and it's like dragging teeth to get them to say anything about themselves. That's not good. So you'd be prepared to actually present yourself confidently, not too verbosely, not overly cocky, but just to present yourself um, uh, uh, with some confidence. Then you have to convince them that you're the best candidate. So even if you haven't got the precise skill sets that they are looking for, the precise, you, know, you never made a battery in your life, right? But you know how to make one. You know the materials that go in there. You understand the process. And you have evidence to say, even though I don't know how to do this right now, my past history tells me, to, can tell you, that I would be very capable of hitting the ground running, coming in and setting up this new piece of equipment or setting up this new, new particular process because I've got evidence to show I've done it before. So you have to take what skill says you you have from your current position, a PhD, postdoc, whatever it is, from your current position, and look for how you can sell that to convince your interview panel that actually, even though you haven't got exactly what they're looking for, you would be the right person for that job because you could pick, you could pick it up so quickly and you could get ready for that new job without, without any problems whatsoever. So that's, you know, and I've said this in person to a couple of people who didn't do so well in their first interview when they were going for a job outside their specific field. But having actually had the conversation with them about what are your skill sets? How do you think you could use those skill sets in this new job? The next interview they went to was that they, they, they nailed it. Okay, so it doesn't have to be exactly in your field, but you have to know how to sell your skill set. So with questions, quite often times you can get led, if you don't understand the question, you can ask, ask them to reiterate the question in a different way ask for clarification. And sometimes, I know I do this, I try and lead the person towards an answer. If they're not, you know, listen for those hints, you know, they're trying to help you. Um, sometimes they're trying to help you uh, answer the question. But if you're not sure, ask. I don't really understand the question. Do, do you mean this? Don't try and answer the question you think they've asked you. Okay, even like in an exam, don't answer the question you think they've asked. Clarify the questions being asked of you, all right? And at the end, always have one question ready. Not necessarily, um, what's my salary going to be? Well, maybe I wouldn't do that until after you were negotiating if you got the job. But you might have a question about the company or about the position or about, you know, you should have one question that, you, that you'd like to, like to ask to show that you're interested. Especially if you've done your homework about the company or about the, the team you're, gonna, you're applying for, you can ask a question to show you actually have done your research and are interested in the job. Okay, then here are some, just some examples that I th always um, think you should be ready for. Um, typical questions that get asked at interviews these days is, is you know, tell us what's your greatest strength and uh, uh, what's your greatest weakness um, and, and why. Uh, I think that's a question that is often asked just to see what sort of answer you'll give to see whether or not you are thoughtful about yourself and understand yourself. So be honest. I mean, um, if, if your, your weakness might be that you're not good at deadlines, not good under stress, you can be honest with that. Look, you know, I, I sometimes I struggle when, when I'm in a really stressful situation. However, this is what I'm doing about that. This is what I do to, to, to alleviate that. So don't be scared to admit um, a, a weakness, but also maybe point out that you're, um, you're willing to learn, willing to grow, and that this is what you're doing about it. Um, and, and don't be too cocky with your strengths either. I mean, talk about your strengths. You know, I'm really good at um, communicating with people. I work really well in a team, or I work well under pressure, whatever. But be able to be ready for the answers for those sorts of questions. Also, majority of the time when you have an answer, it's good to have an example to go with the answer. So, 
oftentimes someone will say, well, give us an example of how maybe you handled something unfamiliar or how you handled a difficult situation, difficult colleague, a deadline. So sometimes I won't say give us an example, but, but they'll say, how do, they might say, how do you handle deadlines? You need to have prepared some answers to, to show that you've been able to do that. So think about an example, be prepared for those sorts of questions. Think of an example of, of okay, when was a time when I had a really difficult situation with one of my colleagues in the lab and, and how did I handle that? Don't be negative, don't bitch, don't moan, but come up with a, 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 um, pro, a proactive or, or a positive way that which you handle that sort of situation. But have the examples ready. Um, and the other thing that gets asked is, uh, okay, so where do you want to be in two years, five years, 10 years time? And the joke when I would apply for my job at Monash oh, a long, long time ago, back in the early 90s, um, I don't remember this, but apparently uh, my colleague said to me afterwards, when they asked me the question, where do you want to be in five years time? Apparently I looked at the um, head of department and I said, I want your job. Like, I don't remember that, but apparently that's what I, what I said. And that was a bit of a joke to break the ice. But do have a think about where do you want to be? You know, not, oh, well, just doing the same thing I'm doing now. You know, show that you have some, some, well, either show you have some aspirations or if the job is one which is a technician's job, for example, you might think about, well, if you tell your, your prospective employer that actually I want to be running a company in, in two years' time, that person's going to think, well, we're not going to keep this guy for very long, so maybe we don't want to employ this particular person because we want to have five-year longevity. So you might want to think about the job you're applying for and what sort of answers you might want to give. If it's a technician's job, you might say, look, I want to try and develop new approaches to running blah, 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 equipment or new approaches, methodologies to. So think about the job and how you might show that you can see how there is growth in that job. Okay. So are you there for the long haul? Is it a stepping stone? Okay. You need to sort of have thought about answers to those questions before you go into an interview. Okay. Let's see if there, is there any questions. I can't see any hands or not. Um, Nope, no hands. No okay. hands, Maria. Okay. Um, okay. So I'm almost finished, actually. So I have to be some questions. Um, so after the interview, actually, even after you send the letter, if you haven't, um, if you've got a negative response or or, uh, or, or not, it's, it's good to have follow up. And the follow up you have depends on obviously what the how the interview went and also um, whether you got response back from your from your application. But if you've had an interview, um, and this is not something I have done in the past, but I've did a lot of you know research prep preparing for this particular seminar, and it seems that what is now accepted, acceptable, and important is writing a short note of thanks via email to acknowledge that basically you appreciate the fact that these people went, um, you know, spent their time to to interview you. Um, you might be able to clarify something that in the interview that you weren't sure about, or you think maybe you didn't present well. Not a long email, but just a short a short um, 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 connection to the to the, the head of the interview panel um, to say, you know, thanks for, for the interview. I really um, looking forward to, to hearing back from you. Um, clarify something if you're not sure about something. Um, and and um, just just to make sure they remember you actually as well in, in, in their head then they're remembering that you're the person that the ex person that they interviewed. If you didn't get the job, again, ask politely for some feedback. Nothing wrong for asking for feedback, whether it's from HR, whether it's from, uh, from um, the interview panel. Um, it really does, and I've seen this happen for me personally, when someone hasn't got a job, they say, well, can I please get some feedback? And I'm very happy to provide that honest feedback um, and, and say why it was maybe they weren't quite the right person for that particular job or they could have done it this way. Or So that's really, really important. Um, and again, and also, as I said before at the beginning, if you're not shortlisted, but it's a job you think you're perfect for, follow up. Follow up and say, you know, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, um, I call them preferably if you can, and say, look, I, I um, apply for this job. I wasn't shortlisted, but I really think I do have a skill set. Um, can I find out why I wasn't shortlisted, and can, do, do I have an opportunity perhaps to, to, uh, to apply again? Um, okay, I think that's pretty much almost has me covered. And I've got a, a hand up there from Holly. Um, okay. Holly, Holly. Hi, yes. Um, so I was just wondering about what you were just saying, Ben. Do you think that it's sort of a, a dangerous or a fine line to walk when you're trying to ask for a feedback? You, know, you don't want to seem like you're 
hassling or you know, trying to kind of brown nose a bit, but um, you know, a good way to approach that without putting pressure on the right panel. So just say you've, if you've had an interview and you didn't succeed, um, the best thing is openly saying, I, I, I um, would love to some feedback for the next time I go for a position um, if, you did, if you weren't successful, right? So afterwards. And I've had that happen to me from people and I'm very happy to give that feedback. Um, and I think most people would be actually. With, um, for example, my son, he did not get shortlisted. He picked up the phone and rang in HR and said, look, you know, I don't quite know. Uh, um, um, you know, it seemed to me I had the right skill set. Why, why was my shortlisted in a nice way? And they said, look, yep, you had good skills, but this is not a research job, you know? So, um, yeah, I guess it's hard though. I've definitely heard from, you know, interview panel members saying, oh, this person's been hassling us about not know, hassling. our decision. And okay. You don't hassle. You, you, you make the one call, the one email, and if they don't respond to you, they're not going to respond to you. But I mean, really a good company or a good, a good, um, uh, um, uh, HR person will respond in some way. Maybe not immediately, but they will respond. Um, I, I don't, I'm not suggesting you hassle. I'm just saying <laughs> no. if you ask, you ask once, either by phone or by email, um, you, you ask for that, 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 um, that response. And most people will give you a response. Um, there are very few people that will not. All right. Thank you very much. Yep. Okay, so just um, just at the end, I've got some links that I found useful in terms of how you write letters, um, interview questions. So there's a lot of, there's a lot out there for you. Some of it's you know a bit dodgy and, and you've got to work around it. But I think that you can probably find stuff out there when you're writing letters and when you're looking at going for interviews. I really recommend you look at some of these web pages. There's a lot more than ones I've put up here for some extra information. Um, there's a lot out there and uh, and it's definitely worth, worth doing your homework before you send that first CV and that first letter because um, you don't want to just rush something in, not professional, hasn't, hasn't hit the mark for the job you're going for and give it to your supervisor, give it to your team, give it to people around you to look at uh, and get advice. Um, that would also be what I would recommend. Otherwise, um, that is it from me. Oops, I'll go back to, if I can just find my first slide. And any questions? Clearly not. Um, I have one, Maria, or maybe not a question. Well, it's something I'd appreciate your um, advice around. In my former job as in sort of that more corporate world versus university, um, something that my boss always insisted or suggested when people were going for interviews was if there is a phone number provided, as part of the, um, for more information, part of the application, you should call. And she was very surprised that when we had job into job op uh, applications up, nobody would actually call her and find out more about the job. Do you think that that's a worthwhile um, I think it's, process? I think it's more than worthwhile. I think it's actually critical that you do that, that you, before you send that, if you think of the job you really want, find out all the information you possibly can. If there's a phone number provided, Ring the number, speak to someone. Um, if if there's a, a web page for you to go and look up the company or the or the group, do that ahead of time. Like really get, do your homework. And I think if there's a number provided, you should ring that number. Hundred percent agree. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. I, I on that as well. I found that in the interviews I've had, um, the the first question, apart from being asked about myself, the next question I'm asked is, what do you know? about ACEs or what do you know about the company? So I, I agree there to do your research beforehand and make sure you know, you know some hard facts about the place that you're trying to get a job at. Absolutely. There's Holly again or Tony? Tony? I was just going to say, when you go to ring somebody about a position, there's nothing worse than answering the phone and you say, yes, how can I help you? And they said, oh, I just want to know more about the position. You have to have precise questions. Otherwise, I sort of feel like you haven't done enough interview, uh, you know, enough research. You're only just ringing me trying to get hints from, from me. You've got to actually be a bit proactive and say, can you tell me how big is the team? You know, what, what do you expect from the person in this role? You need to actually ask some leading questions. Uh, good point, Tony. I agree. So maybe, maybe again, a, a list of questions like that of, of, that you need to think about. And that's a great one. What, what do you expect that the person in this role would be is a, is a great question. If it's not clear from the advertisement, then, then that's actually a really, good, a really good question. But also, 
you know, doing your research beforehand, doing your home beforehand is, is really, really important about, you know, in, in, in terms of before you actually even pick up the phone. But having done that, then have the right questions in mind. I agree. Colin? Hi, Maria. Thanks for the talk. Um, do you actually look at key selection criteria that they get through? Is that more of a HR thing? Uh, yeah, okay. So I'm... It, this depends, right? And this depends on the type of person for, uh, on the interview panel. So, um, strictly speaking, the the way it works, say, at university now, is that the HR, and maybe it's true also for companies, the HR crew will first shortlist everything for you, right? And they will look for the fact that you've, you've actually um, responded to the criteria, selection criteria. They will look at that. And if you haven't done that, you often won't get past them before you even get to, to, to the inter interview team. Um, and so it's important that you do look at what the advertisement is wanting, look at what they are asking for and address the criteria. At the very least, try and address them so you can get to that first, that first step, okay? Um, so do I then look at them? Yes and no. Yes, I'll look to see that they have, that the essential criteria are, are there. But I also look beyond that. I mean, I think I'd look beyond that in terms of, well, what else do they offer? What else is, is, does their CV offer? Because sometimes you might not know how to run a GCMS, for example, but you know how to run, have done some other instrumentation. So, damn, you can learn how to use that GCMS. So, you know, sometimes there's criteria there which are, which are very specific, but if you haven't got that particular skill, you might say, well, but I've got other skills that demonstrate that I'm, I'm adaptable or flexible. I can learn this other skill. So I'm not as black and white, but I do know to get through HR, you need to have... Yeah. Uh, I need to have addressed the skills, yes. Because I guess often the questions or the answers that you provide in your key selection criteria are going to come up in your interview and you might almost feel like you're repeating yourself. Yes, um, oftentimes in the interview, you will be asked to elaborate on what you've written your criteria. So, so maybe don't, don't write, like I don't think you need to write oodles and oodles of, you know, like, a lot of stuff around the criteria. Be, be, be succinct, but to the point. You know, address the criteria as succinctly as you can. And then the interview gives you opportunity to expand on that. Uh, but you do have to show that, that you have looked at the criteria at least. Not much point going for a job where you're going to be a technician, where you, you're you know, running a lab where you've never, you know, you're a modeler, for example, okay, or, or vice versa. Um, you know, you need to be able to demonstrate that you've done, that you are aware um, that, you have the criteria, that you have the criteria that they require. Yeah, thanks, Mary. Mm -hmm. um, who's that? I, I don't might... I have as a hand up with uh, Alu Mayo. Uh, Hi, so it's um, Alu Mayo. Hi, Alu Mayo. Yes, thank you for your presentation. It's really helpful. So, I guess my question is when is a good time to start applying for positions? Because I've heard from people who say you don't want to be too early, especially with, I'm doing a PhD. And it's like, I was told by my friends who had been through the process that I should wait until I submit. Because employers didn't take them seriously until they had submitted. Hmm. Interesting. Um, I guess it depends on the job you're looking for. If you are applying for a, post a postdoctoral position, I don't think it hurts to start early because, you know, if you're applying um, overseas or, I mean, do, and, and you should look at the criteria as well. I mean, if they want someone to start immediately, then there's not much point you applying. Um, but generally speaking, people, you know, there's a lag time. People will wait three or four months for somebody if, they're, if you're really good. Um, I think if you're applying for specific jobs, as opposed to putting your CV out there to different people, for specific jobs, probably you want to wait to your closer submission. I wouldn't wait till after I've submitted. That, that's almost, then you've got, what do you do for three or four months while you're waiting? Um, I think you apply before you submit, but you have to be aware of when you're likely to submit. Don't apply a year ahead of time. Um, so, you know, in my case, I guess, if I was looking for when I started you know, applying many, many moons ago, I think three months ahead of my submission date, I began to decide where I want to apply. Um, I, I would not wait till after submission myself. Okay. But don't apply for jobs which you want you to start immediately if you're not going to finish your PhD for three months. That's 
probably not so good. But again, you know what, you pick up the phone. Again, this is where you would ring up. You say, look, uh, you know, if there's a job that's, uh, that's been advertised and you think you're perfect for that job, but you're three months off submitting or four months off submitting, you ring up and you say, look, I, I think I'd be good, you know, ask a bit about the job and you, you introduce yourself and say, I want to apply, but, you know, here's my, here's my timeline, time frame. And they might say, thank you, but no thank you. Or they might say, you know, please send us, send us in your application. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Mm -hmm. Sophia. Sophia's got her hand up. Sorry. I have a question. I guess it's a fine line between putting too much in your in your selection criteria and your CV, and then the HR people read it and do the first lot of culling. And I've had instances myself where they've said, you've got too much experience. Yeah. You would be bored in this job. Yeah. And that is really, really hard to come back with because you know, I've applied for that job because that's what I want to do. It's not up to them to question my is my to question my motives. What yep. is your take on that? I, I agree with you on that, um, and and it's it is hard because you you if someone's applied for a, for a job, you have to assume that they're applied because they're interested. But but of course, when you've got fifty people applying for a particular job because there are so few jobs out there, there's got to be some way of culling, and. I don't like what HR does the first call. And you're right. If you put in too much, in, too much information, is that someone ringing me? <laughs> Sorry, I don't know what's going on there. Um, if that, if that's, um, if you put in too much, if you, you know, I know uh, your example, for example, Sophia, you came from a really strong background, right? You've done all this IT stuff. You've done heaps of great stuff. And then you wanted to come back, step back a bit and do something that wasn't quite as, as intense. That was your choice to make. Um, now, and, and that's that's true for a lot of people actually. And so I think if you if you write all your experience into your CV, now let me step back. You should put into your CV what you want the employer to know. If you don't think that your skill set in uh, you know having a hundred publications and doing X, X, X seminars and whatever else is of relevance to the job you are applying for, don't put it in. So so write your CV and your letter according to what it is that you are applying for. So perhaps don't overshare, don't put everything in there unless it's relevant to the, uh, the application, uh, to the job you're applying for. That would, I think, be my take on, on that actually. For the very reasons that you just mentioned, people will say, well, why on earth is this person applying for this job? That's my feeling, but, and others might have other, other thoughts. I mean, Tony, you have your hand up, you've got an idea on that one? Yeah, I just, I, and also the other, I agree. The other thing is I would say when you're addressing the selection criteria, be really succinct and dot points and only address what's going to affect this job and maybe leave a few of the other things in the CV so they can say, oh, look, they've also got experience in this that we might be able to use, mm -hmm. but don't oversell it. And the other thing that is my pet hate, I see the selection criteria and they say, see my CV. Oh. I'm not there to go and look at your CV to try and sell yourself or dig through it to find out what skills you've got. Like, so I automatically just skip and go forward. That's just personally. Yeah, no, I agree with you. you need to tell, I agree with what you said that the dot pointing is a really good one. I don't like verbose. Dot pointing is really good for the, for the criteria and, and, and tell them what, no, tell them in, the, in, in that document, not direct them to the CV. I agree. It's tough out there, guys. I mean, it's, it's, this is the problem. I mean, you know, every, every job that, um, that we've advertised, we get so many applications and then you've got to sift through and see which ones are really the ones that are worth interviewing. And sometimes you probably, I'm sure we miss people who would be really good at some of the jobs that, um, that we have, but, but when you've got 80 applications and HR does the first cull for you, you know, I mean, Jenny, if you, are you there, Jenny? You've had some experience. If you're there, do you want to, Jenny Prinkle, do you want to step in with any, any thoughts from your experience with interviewees and, and yeah, I am here. Yeah, um, I, I can you hear me? All right. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I, 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 I did. I do find the selection criteria really useful. Actually, I mean, you don't have to write absolutely loads, but the problem with CVs after CVs is they do 
they can kind of look a bit the same. <laughs> so that it's really important, as you've said before, to make yours very individual. But the selection criteria, if it's been well written for a very specific job, it tries to draw out those really important points. Like it could be as specific as, you know, experience in synthesizing, you know, ionic liquids or experience with battery assembly or something. So they're quite specific often, and that's the chance. And and if you can't answer that specifically, then as you said, you, you say, well, look, I've never made a battery, but I've made this kind of device that's very similar and uses similar techniques but it's a chance for you to to really tell them why you're the right person for the job rather than something as generic as the cv so yeah. i find those really useful as a as an initial look yeah yep no i i i, I guess sometimes there are jobs where they don't have selection criteria better yeah by that's, that's unfortunate if you're trying to answer an advert that's been very badly written then that's then that's a real challenge I think, and then in that case, perhaps as as you've said, phone up and actually ask some more specific questions so that you can specifically tell them why you're the best person for that job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. agreed. Is there anyone else that wants to offer any advice or comment or question? No. Nope. I guess. Um. Sorry, I'll just jump in really quickly. Just to an extension to this webinar, I'll be doing one on crafting um, a LinkedIn profile on the 3rd of June, if you haven't already sure. registered to it. So, um, you know, especially a few people that have listened to this, that'll be good to, um, yeah, then um, jump onto that one as well. I think that's an excellent idea. And as just before, just beforehand, before this summer, we had a, a bit of a team group around um, someone presenting to us a thing called, um, it's, it's a disc, disc flex, which is a, a, a something about uh, personalities and type of people that, that we might, type of, type of traits that we have and how we identify that in a LinkedIn profile and how then you address a message to someone on LinkedIn based on understanding the sort of profile that they have, whether they want to have details or, or short letter or... So actually it might be another, another webinar to have, Sam, where we're, um, Genevieve Reed is the person who did it for us, where she can go take, take us through maybe how you might identify the sort of person you're writing to on LinkedIn when you're trying to make a connection. Um, yeah, definitely. That would be something, I, I, think I, I, I think we had a pretty good session just beforehand. So I think uh, it might be a good webinar to have as well. Okay, great. LinkedIn is very, very important. Uh, it's very important these days, I think. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Right, I'm, I'm done. So Lauren, are we? Yeah, if no one else has any questions, I think we will say a massive thank you to Maria. It's been so incredibly insightful and useful and it's, it's uh, their skills that we take forward no matter if you're, you're 20 or, or 55. So um, thank you so much for your time and um, good luck to all the job seekers out there. And um, I'm sure Maria's tips will be very useful. All right, good luck. Good luck, guys. Just stop sharing. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Bye-bye. Thanks, Maria.